Hey everybody, um, welcome. You're very welcome to our next uh, guest speaker event for Disaster Relief Australia. Before we go on, I have to do the usual and say the Eve Galair, uh, or the uh, Clan, are fudding it down, uh, are rash and um, So only a few of us will understand what that means. So our next speaker tonight is a guy called Billy Hedermon, um, who needs uh, has a rather extensive um, backstory and a rather needs a, a rather flowing. Um, introduction, I'll try and do the man some justice. Um, Billy entered the cadet school in November of 2001 and after 21 months of training he was posted a 3rd Infantry Battalion in Kilkenny uh, which is in the southern part of uh, the Republic of Ireland. Myself and Billy were in the same cadet class together back in back in those halcyon days. Um, Billy, uh, sorry, he was posted the southern part of the Republic of Ireland. Um, Ireland Special Forces is known as the Skihon Fenoglach na Heron, which is, translates into the Army Ranger Wing, uh, or ARW for short, for shorthand. So you'll probably hear that term used throughout the throughout the talk. Okay. The way the system works in Ireland, though, is that when you finish your basic training or you finish your cadetship, you're sent for a full scholarship while being paid to university. And Billy himself went to the University of Limerick, where he studied PE teaching, um, in 2004. Um, Upon graduation, Billy deployed overseas and he deployed tw indeed twice in his career. And once in 2008 as a platoon commander to Chad, which is somewhere where a lot of us in the Irish Defence Forces served at the time. Um, and in 2014 to Bosnia as a staff officer. Um, some of you, uh, Billy then retired in, in 2014 from the Irish Defence Forces. And as, as some of you will be aware, there's a system called the Overseas Lateral Transfer Scheme. And Billy availed of this system, and like many, many Irishmen before him, um, he smuggled his way into Australia um, and landed on the shores of uh, Queensland initially. Billy was originally posted to 6 RIR uh, up in Brisbane. And after landing and getting uh, comfortable there with his, new, with his wife, uh, Rita, on New Year's Eve in 2014, Billy suffered a catastrophic injury while surfing on Kings Beach in the Sunshine Coast which he'll tell you more about um, during his talk. Um, Billy served in a number of appointments upon, um, from the injury himself that he, he was, a, Billy was initially uh, uh, anticipated to be a quadriplegic, but Billy fought his way back to full health and served in a number of appointments with the Australian Defence Forces, both home and overseas, but I won't ruin the story. Billy himself has one hell of a tale to tell, um, of which I'm sure we will all definitely take something away from. And without further ado, I'll hand it over to Billy. And just remember, if anyone has any questions, uh, pop them up in the Q&A section here, send me a quick email, or you can text me or send me a WhatsApp because I have my phone beside me. Um, and without any further ado, I'm just going to hand over to Billy. Cheers, thanks Karen, and thanks for the awesome intro. Um, we might just uh, push through straight away maybe, if you can run through it.
Awesome, Kyron. Thanks for that. Um, so yeah, just just leave it on that one for now. Is is all good? Um, usually there's a bit of sound with that, you know, sorry and dramatic music, but uh, no, it's all good. You you get the gist of it. So um, thanks a million um, for the intro. You guys kind of see from there um, probably some of the some of the difficulty in returning from um, the um, accident that, as Kyron mentioned, happened in, in uh, New Year's Eve day in 2014. Um, and, and we'll chat about that. But um, I think first and foremost, I'll give you a, a little bit of scope and kind of what I'd hope to chat to you guys about um, today. So um, first thing is um, probably give you some indication as to before that accident, um, what, it, what <laughs> what it, what occurred um uh kind of different challenges so particularly two different challenges in my life prior to that which probably um then um uh set me up uh, for the accident speak a little bit about the accident and then to be honest with you um i would like to probably park it there and move on from the actual the story because the story is just giving you context to probably what is or i would find more interesting um, and I'd hope that other people would as well. And that's actually the context behind our, the so what and, and actually some some positive indications as to um, what are lessons that I've learned from all of this and then what I apply in my own life and what I'd offer to anybody um, in any kind of situation that may be uh, to consider. So that's and that's pretty much it. It's just like, hey, here's things that work for me um, in this particular situation. And it might be it might be something for yourself. So um, two different challenges prior to the accident, I suppose, and, and Kyron did a really good summary at start off with, but one of the challenges, obviously, and it probably resonates with a lot of the uh, veterans um, listening in, is um, that within the military, so the military itself being quite a challenge in itself. And I think the obvious one was probably, as Kyron had alluded to, um, the the special forces background and, and the challenges that um, that one faces when they go down that kind of path. Um, and I, I suppose I, I should probably, I should probably put a disclaimer in on this particular photo. So, uh, or this mo beautiful montage that although I am in the general vicinity of some of these photos, that isn't. So for instance, that's not actually me climbing the ladder, but I was there, I was there uh, that day. And same, I, I, I'm in the chopper, I'm not the, not the guy sliding down in that particular stage because I know somebody will will chip me on that as as uh, as veterans love to do. Um, but to, to to probably start on that right, first major challenge is obviously um, um, joining or or attempting to join a an elite high performing team um, and the methodology behind that right. So it's you know you go through the gate like everybody else does trying to do a a selection process and it's um, very physically arduous and tough um, and trying to do it is is a really big challenge but of course um having being um staff on the other side of it whereby we have where basically i was lucky enough subsequently in subsequent years to be part of the staff that runs selection courses i can tell you that you know um physical capacity and all that it's it's only a tool it's only a vehicle in order to get people really to what what you really want to see and um, which is their mental capacity to uh, and probably their character so it's like the, the all the physical stuff it's just the, the the tool in order to when you actually lift the lid it's it's kind of asking people the question of how bad do you really really want this um and the the answer obviously has to be i want it more um i want it more than than i'm currently being pushed through so and that was a really i mean i did i did selection at a, at a young age and it was a really massive learning curve for me um probably a rub of the green in a couple of occasions where you're really on your chin strap um and um i was lucky enough to have to have gotten through and then to be recommended to serve so subsequently as karen mentioned after i kind of um went overseas and got a little bit more experience they 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 thankfully called me back into the unit and I went on um, subsequent challenges obviously in the unit so you know your your actual reinforcement cycle or your kind of collective uh, SF skills training and loads of loads of challenges in that in relation to um, I suppose the cell uh, very different in terms of as opposed to um, overt um, a selection process it's more an awful lot of self-assessment and 
you know, wondering, are you good enough for this yourself? And, you know, while you could have a peak where one day you've absolutely nailed a particular uh, drill or, 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 or a, a, an evolution of something next day, you know, if you if you miss a particular target or you miss somebody hiding behind a door, it's it's the worst thing on earth for you and, and, and feeling and challenging through those days again, not not essentially while it is physically arduous. Um, it was probably the the mental uh, agility to try and get through those things. And of course, the last part of the challenge was both serving and commanding in that unit. And the challenges that that faced from actually um, conducting, you know, operations or, uh, and training, but also the management of special forces soldiers and the difficulty there, there in, you know, uh, maintaining the standards and even the the honesty of effort that um, you would have to show um, yourself in order to um, probably, um, like I was never, I was never the best at anything. But I think a lot of the times it was, um, even if I was particularly poor at something, to do it and then to learn more or, or, or to to push yourself through it and say, OK, I'm weak at this and show show weakness, be brave enough to show weakness, but actually then to to fix it. Right. So there was there was some things that I was definitely not particularly good at, um, you know, and, and when you're. You know, the, 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 the leader, people have the idea of the leader being, oh, you should be, you should be the leader of everything. Um, but um, there was occasions where I definitely was not. But I think it probably would have been worse if I just hid behind my desk, behind administration or anything like that, um, as opposed to actually showing, hey, this is a weakness. It's kind of awkward that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not where I should be. Um, but if I and and you know I got I got to fix that you know if I expect my guys to do it I need to do it and um, so I need to fix that myself um, so they were they were key challenges um, I think that I that I learned within the military and it was you know all all the all the cool pictures and cool things that we did but actually the application of of some of those things from a from a, a psychological perspective it was an awesome exposure to you know the classic uh, the life less ordinary and that challenge and a really positive outcome because it's such a small unit and such a um you know um an elite position to find yourself in to be commanding you know the 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 smallest crew of 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 the best um that there is um you know it didn't it didn't go by didn't go by anything um for me so um that's pretty much it. Like I'll, I'll park the military stuff and, and move on to the next one, um, Kyron, if that's all right. So I suppose um, while the military stuff will resonate probably with um, a lot of veterans out there, um, and it's probably in general a positive experience behind the challenge that, that, that I faced, um, the next kind of, um, I suppose, two stories are, are definitely um, the flip side of that and something that, um, that really challenged um, me and, and a lot of people. And I, I, I use this probably um, almost selfishly uh, uh, relating it back to myself when, of course, um, it's, it's, not, it's, it's not about me, neither of these stories are. But um, to give context, obviously, neither of, of, of both of these stories are particularly, um, are particularly good stories. Um, so uh, just to give a quick synopsis, um, on the uh, left-hand side, um, that's myself with my four um, buddies from when we were 11, 12, uh, as far back as when we were 11 or 12 years old in school. Um, and that is um, in Cardiff, the day that um, Ireland won the uh, Grand Slam for the first time in, I think, something like 70 or 80 years or something like that. And I had actually only, so it was in uh, 2009, and I had just come back from, from deployment um, and a bit of a holiday. Um, and when I was on the, uh, just finishing up from the deployment and, and kind of on the holiday, um, my my buddy, um, the guy that's closest to me there, Barry. He had told me that our our, our very close friend from from school, um, Aiden, the guy with a with a hand sticking out at the top of his head there, with a big big smile on his he uh, uh, face, um, that he was he was suffering pretty badly um, from from depression at the time. So we um, we took it upon ourselves as Ireland was going well in, in the Six Nations. Um, we asked uh, Aidan's parents what they thought about it. We asked Aidan, would he like to travel to to Wales um, with us? And obviously we um, we went, we had a great weekend. Um, and 
um, unfortunately, so that was that was on the Sunday, um, and unfortunately, um, the following Thursday, um, Aidan took his own life, um, which was really really um, sad occasion for for him for his well, for his family um, and for all of us. And I have to say that it was extremely difficult to to comprehend and to deal with that. And there was an awful lot of questions um, that I asked myself at the time that I could have and should have done more because I knew that he was sick. Um, you know, I even had conversations with him the week prior, um, asking him to to reach out to me. And then, our, our, you know, you know, that classic, you know, please don't do anything uh, like that. And then, you know, you're kind of second guessing the conversations that you had or should have, would have, could have. Or, and even on that Thursday evening, I've been... Um, training, uh, rugby training close to his house, only 500 metres from his house is where the rugby pitch was. And I was going to call down to him, but I didn't bother because I just bought a car with my overseas money, as you do, uh, and I didn't want to show off to him. Um, and I left it off that night and all that kind of stuff. So it was just a very, very difficult time, very, very sad experience. And um, I probably at the time even didn't, didn't deal with it particularly well. Um, the second story as well, so over on the right-hand side, you'll see uh, myself and my buddy, my buddy from 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 college, um, Alan, and uh, Alan was just a superb uh, sportsman, absolutely awesome, and we'd remained uh, really close friends throughout our time. So after even we finished um, uni in '08, throughout all that time, we had we'd even done some charity work together. We um, um, climbed Kilimanjaro, um, ra raising some money together, and did a, a couple of other bits and pieces. Um, kind of uh, close with him and his family. And um, that actually was taken. So I had asked Alan to be, um, so again, coming back from Bosnia, I again, foolishly with a lot of money, decided that I would uh, get engaged. Um, and um, I'd, asked, I'd asked Alan to be uh, one of my groomsmen. Um, and that was actually at myself and Rita's engagement party outside, outside our house. That was in um, August in 2013. And then Unfortunately, um, that November, so Alan was uh, subsequently teaching, so he's a PE teacher, um, and his brother, a uh, younger brother, was um, actually going through the college in, in, in Limerick as well at the time, um, kind of following, following us through. And the two of them were in the, in the gym, in, in, in the uni, um, and Alan, uh, unfortunately, um, had, a, uh, had a brain hemorrhage and, and just dropped in the in the gym, uh, unfortunately, and passed away right then and there. And again, it was exceptionally tough times, really, really challenging. And both of these um, a, a very, very negative, uh, very, very tough times for, for anybody to pull through and for the families, for the friends, for everybody, and even for myself as well. I found it quite difficult to, to kind of comprehend a lot in relation to um, dealing with these things. Um, but I, I think um, I'll probably go back to these two stories and reflect on them a little bit more when we push through um, the story, the story of the actual um, accident itself. But they're just two challenges um, I, I would probably present to you before, uh, just to give context before I actually talk about uh, talk about the accident. So uh, maybe we might click on Kyron if that's all right. Uh, yeah, and then and then what did you do, Billy? You idiot. You went into the surf on uh, New Year's Eve day in Caloundra and Kings Beach. Lovely beach, by the way, in the sunny coast. Um, and took in a, a, a bodyboard. Um, and even though I've been surfing plenty of times and bodyboarding and all that kind of stuff, uh, plenty of times, um, pretty much a stronger wave caught me unawares and, and spotted me into the, into the sandbar below. Um, Fractured my C3, C4, damaged my spinal cord at that area, and then also had a uh, minute fracture in the in the T5. Um, so they um, uh, the AMBO brought me to Nambour Hospital, where uh, subsequently I um, got the uh, chopper down to um, Sunny Coast. Uh, sorry, to um, the Princess Alexandria Hospital, um, where on my the unfortunate. Um, Experience of being the uh, probably the first uh, person in 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 ICU in the new year in the wee hours of the morning. So I rang in 2015, unfortunately, um, completely paralyzed. So I, I could move a a toe and a thumb, 
and the outlook um, definitely didn't didn't look great um, at that stage. Uh, yeah, next one again. So um, what happened? Well, um, I was uh, diagnosed uh, incomplete quadriplegia. So um, it was um, a, a, with central cord syndrome, uh, which wasn't necessarily a bad thing. So I could move a toe and a thumb and nothing else. Um, but obviously I had lost all function. So I had lost um, bladder function, bowel function, sexual function, pretty much everything. And what they did, luckily enough, they didn't have to fuse the C3 and C4 together um, because there was no direct pressure on the spinal cord. And also I was lucky enough as well that uh, it wasn't a complete severance of the spinal cord, it was incomplete. So to be honest with you, um, even as early on as in the ambulance, we, well, I definitely took it as kind of two wins during the day because the first one was one, I didn't drown. I was really lucky that a young boy had seen me, called for help. And the first two people who ran in was an ex-emergency nurse and a guy studying sports medicine. And they took seats by in control and carried me out of the water. So the serendipity of that is not lost on me. Um, and the second win was probably that um, it wasn't complete um, quadriplegia. And anybody who's dealt with any kind of level of spinal cord injury will know the, the severity of uh, and the, the, the unlikelihood of um, return of function from a, a complete injury. So those two things were actually, as far as I was concerned, when I got the, got the initial uh, diagnosis uh, at about 4 a.m. On, uh, on New Year's Day morning in the ICU in, in Brisbane, uh, I was at right, well, you know what? Um, that's that's kind of two wins today. Um, and what does that mean for me? It means I got a lot of work to do because, um, yeah, it, it means that there's, and you know, you ask the question, will I walk in? Doctor is going to be non-committal on that. But uh, yeah, we'll do something as opposed to nothing at all. But as you can see, obviously, um, it was it was it was a pretty pretty grim um, existence. Yep. Um. So late January 2015. Um, so this is, I think it's like 20, 28th or 29th of January was the first time that um, I managed to, to stand up. And I don't want to go into kind of a lot of the gory details, but it was, like I said, just an exceptionally grim um, existence for the first number, um, obviously, of weeks and, and months and all the rest of it. So um, and obviously you can see, you know, um, the 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 bag on my leg with the catheter involved and all that kind of stuff. And there was there was a lot of. Um, discomfort a lot of pain and a lot of challenges even trying to get to that stage where you know you had no actual control of anything but there was pain emanating from everywhere um you know um being hoisted up from your bed uh, like raised up like frankenstein um you know uh wardies coming along pivoting you from left to right so that your blood didn't pool um lifting you up on a sling from like bed to chair and then being pushed around all day and it was like uh, you know when you think about if if, if anybody um like if uh, and particularly probably for for anybody who's who's been at a high level of anything you know or, or, or you know successful in your life you think of going from that to this kind of existence it is a massive um gut check and you know i used i used to be somebody i used to be bloody this um you know ex special forces um skydiving um you know adventure racing person and now you know i've 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 got tubes where they shouldn't be and i've got uh, you know I, I i've got people basically feeding me non solids um, for potentially the rest of my life. So um, it was exceptionally difficult to go through those kind of things. But at the flip side of it, what you're looking at is you're looking at um, probably a progression. And I was lucky in terms of the level of progression that I was I was pushing through with, whereby it went from from standing to um, and the, the video is kind of paused here, but from there to to walking very, very slowly. Here we go. Um, and, and realistically, um, I think an awful lot of it was around the perception of um, getting after getting after what I could. Right. So it's um, the way I looked at it, it, it was quite it was almost like um, putting on almost that that military mindset where you're kind of talking about. Right. Um, the gap between. So doctors, you know, when you ask them, they say, what what will come back? And they say, we don't know because the spinal cord needs, the swelling needs to down the spinal cord. So we don't know. So actually I thought that was a good thing because like, well, the goalpost isn't set to how much I can get back. And the gap between what I 
could get back and what I would get back. Well, that gap actually resided with me. Um, so it was upon myself to work as hard as possible to get as much back as possible in the time that I could. So where they said to me, OK, we're going to do four stands today. I would intentionally try and do six or eight or whatever. So when they said, all right, we're going to we're going to walk for four steps. I say, right, uh, cool, no worries, but I'm actually going to push beyond what you're asking of me to do. Uh, not and not just from the physical sense of getting things back, but also from kind of the mental capacity of like, and, and I talk this in kind of the lessons learned, but actually getting after it myself and feeling like um, I had some sort of level of of personal control on on where this was all going and what we were doing um, throughout. Uh, I think you can. I just keep shuffling around here, Karen. So you can probably click to the next one, dude. Uh, yeah, I think this. Uh, if we can just go back one and try and play that. Yeah, try and play that one. So this is probably and there's a couple of things on this um, that I'll, I'll point out to people. So um, again, challenging very close to the limit here. So that belt I meant to. There's meant to be somebody, a nurse walking around with me, but I was like, OK, I'm just going to do it around my room itself. There's a couple of things I, I probably point out to people. So that's my bed just coming up there. And there's a couple of things. One is there's a piece of paper over the TV screen, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. There's the purple hoist that I'll speak a little bit about as well in a minute. And the last thing is probably in relation to when I was mentioning kind of the challenges and 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 making it almost hard for myself and pushing the limits. So that was my that was my yellow wheelchair. Um, and I very, very um, early on in the piece when I was still shuffling around and doing things like that, I was like, right, um, look. Um, take the wheelchair out of the room, please. Um, so um, if I want to go to, um, you know, so that they would bring food to you if you need it, but you could go to the to the to the food room. And I was like, right, if the wheelchair is there, if it's an option for me, I may use it if I'm tired. But if it's outside the room, I would have to walk to it even to use it and making it like that difficult for myself meant that, um, you know, I was consistently in that state of pushing myself very close to that limit and challenging myself consistently um, in order to get like there was no way that I could turn around at the end of it and say I could have tried harder or, uh, you know, uh, only if I, uh, I did this. I'll give one more anecdote on that, and that's um, my father. So different people, and uh, I don't talk about the support that I did get throughout this talk, but that was that was a massive part of this as well. And it was um, it was uh, my father came over, and he used to come in every morning at um, um, help me out at you know 7 a.m. He'd come in and they'd drop down the breakfast, and he'd help me because obviously the major part of this. So visually here you can see my legs coming back but actually the most difficult part particularly for central cord syndrome is your hands and my hand dexterity so even though and even when the halo brace came off and and i could walk around again actually manipulating anything learning to ride again learning to dress myself closing even these buttons here today um you know it still um it, it was a massive challenge so with that in mind, he used to come in and he used to sort out my breakfast for me. He used to, you know, put the wee picks in the bowl. He used to, um, you know, uh, peel open a yogurt and then I'd have an adaptive spoon that I would try to hold and then start eating. Anyway, uh, one particular day I said, hey, dad, tomorrow come in at 11. And he said, why? And I said, well, I don't want you to be here for breakfast. And he said, well, OK, but, you know, and I said, I get I get it. I get it. But here's what's going to happen. I'm going to, you know, in the classic military, I'm going to adapt, improvise and basically overcome opening up this yogurt or I'm going to go hungry. Right. And it was like that. It was like, right. If 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 the option of you being present is there, I might take it. But if you're not there, I'm going to have to come up with some way of opening that that bloody yogurt. And sure enough, over time, I, I, uh, I ended up opening the yogurt and there was there was good celebrations. But of course. And then the next part of this, and we'll we'll, we'll click on again, Kyron. Um, part of this as well was not stopping there. So you know, um, the day that like I opened the yogurt, and then my dad comes in, and he says, "Oh, you opened the yogurt, and 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 let's celebrate that." I was like, "Cool, awesome." 
and I am exceptionally grateful. So, and you know, when the halo brace came off and all that, exceptionally grateful. I was one of very few people who managed to walk out of a spinal injuries unit. But um, I, I, I again used a kind of mantra for myself, grateful, but not satisfied. So it was like exceptionally grateful and lucky for what I got, but I can't just sit on my laurels, clap myself on the back, high fives and let's, let's knock off. Um, only starting. And to give an example on this, when the halo did come off, so it was actually on a Friday afternoon, some two and a half months later, um, that following, uh, and that's the weekend, and obviously I had lost an awful lot of muscle mass and, uh, and all the rest of it. The following Monday morning, came back in, they gave me a weekend pass um, to, go, to go home, which was great, but um, the following Monday morning, came in straight down to the physio gym and just got on a, a, a a bike, just an exercise bike, like even though it wasn't my time to go down to the exercise gym and just banged out an hour on the exercise bike and they were like, what are you doing? So well, it was the first time I've sweated. It's also the first time, by the way, I've seen my waist in 2015, which is kind of cool. But I was like, yeah, like, wh what do you think I'm going to do next? Of course, of course, I'm going to push myself further. Of course, I'm going to challenge my body and challenge myself mentally to try and get back um, as much as I can. Yeah, next again. And that's what I did. So, you know, come come May of, of that year. And again, I got um, uh, moved on from the from the spinal injuries unit, released. And then thankfully, because I was still an ADF member, um, I was in rehabilitation and base. And some people don't have great um, um, stories behind um, either rehabilitation or anything like that in the ADF. Uh, fortunately for me, I did. Um, so and, you know, I, I like you know, access to hydrotherapy, zero gravity treadmills, all this kind of good stuff. Um, so in May, um, you know, um, literally my wife, so I couldn't drive yet. I, I couldn't manipulate um, vehicles or anything or get clearance. So while we were driving and that's uh, on base on the running track there in, in Inagra, I said, hey, pull in here. I'm going to just try and try and jog 50 meters. And I did. And I was like, right, I've jogged 50 meters and what's next? And then it was like, right, try and do a BFA run. And then, right, what's next? And what's next? And what's next? And uh, click on there again, please, Karen. And um, so then by um, by July, you know, so I went from like you know the 50 meters to 2.4 to so I I only ran a 2.4 on a on a I think it was like a Friday, and the following Tuesday I did a 4k around base, and I was like, you know what? I'm going to go up to Woody Point and sign up for a 10k that Saturday. Um, and my wife's like, of course, of course, you absolute lunatic, uh, please don't fall over. But again, it was kind of getting back to the um, feeling of uh, like as much like I didn't really care about the timing or anything like that. But it was because I used to run 10 Ks before uh, and it's like trying to uh, establish that sense of self-worth again. And um, so, yeah, I, I, I went, went off to Woody Point and did it and, and ran the 10 K in I think it was July. July of 2015, which 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 uh, uh, some people find a little bit strange, um, and of course, uh, if you're if you're kind of following the the trail of thought on this one, sorry, Kyron, go ahead. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, so of course you don't think I stopped there, right? Um, so uh, <laughs> January of uh, of 2016, uh, went went back out skydiving again. Had to do that. Had to do that. And of course, um, you know, pushing it on years later, and I'll talk about kind of goal setting in a, in a little bit, but pushing it out years later, managing to get to a level of deployability, um, getting to a standard where people thought that I could work uh, well with them again, um, and actually deploying and, and, and getting, getting out there and actually um, probably, um, you know, providing capability back to the ADF, which again served for me to give massive self-worth and, 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 and all the rest of it. Um, that's, I think I'll probably park like the story element um, there and, and just kind of leave it at that and push on through to the actual, the, the bits that I think um, probably um, hopefully will, will apply, apply more uh, and the bits that I, I, I'm more interested to kind of push out to people um, so we might click on again. Uh, the classic military phrase. So what? So what? Therefore, so what to you uh, listening or watching or anything like that? What's what's the relevance of this to you? You know, like uh, I joke about it. I say, yeah, cool story, bro. But, you know, what what what's this all about? 
So, you know, um, I got kind of really into afterwards reading about both um, probably performance psychology, um, some so, so mental toughness, resilient, like personal resilience in general, and, and probably try to distill down things that either I applied or, or have context for in relation to some of the challenges prior and, and going through this particular probably challenge of a lifetime, right? Um, and I've tried to distill it down to to four things, and these are the four things that I would offer up to to you guys um, to to maybe maybe think about it, maybe apply them, or or don't. So uh, yeah, the first one, um, kind of a psychology phrase, but uh, Jacko uh, Will Will Chick um, probably has it uh, phrased a little bit stronger when he had that book, Extreme Ownership, and that's essentially what this is, right? Internal locus of control is controlling the controllables. Um, ownership of, of of it yourself, right? Ownership of what you can, um, and I I would equate it to even in 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 in, um, in free fall terms and skydiving, right? You can't control gravity, but you can control your reaction to to gravity, um, which therefore actually controls where you go. So, um, and some people like um, may see um, the burden of responsibility or our ownership, but um, I probably see it or I would make an argument that there's also a freedom in that because there's the sense that you're actually driving your own life and that, you know, you're making you're, you're making things happen as, a, as opposed to being being a passenger. And to probably go back to um, that 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 uh, video where I showed the 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 um, uh, A4 piece of paper over the TV screen, this was it. And this is um, Invictus by William Henley, which is probably made more um, contemporary by um, both the Invictus games and uh, by um, the movie Invictus and Nelson Mandela. But essentially, and Henley, extremely uh, interesting character himself, um, but it really resonated with me um, and uh, my wife printed it and I used to reread it over and over again. It wasn't as if I was going anywhere in a hurry anyway. So, um, you know, um, I used to reread it, reread it, particularly the last stanza and the, and the last two lines being, of course, I am the master of my fate and I am the captain of my soul. So no matter what else happens, I, I, I cannot control my body, but I can control my reaction and my thoughts to that. And my reaction and thoughts can either be positive and saying, right, get after it, or I can, I can, I can kind of feel sorry for myself and, 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 and feel like, like uh, you know, this is now my life, and so on. So, so I would say, no matter what the circumstances are, one of the things that I have found to serve me well, and and I, the tool I use for that is self-talk. Uh, you know, uh, as weird as as some people might think, one is who who does that. But um, the what I would offer is um, essentially to to own your situation, to to actually get a grip on things and and own it yourself. Um, the second one that I, I always thought was really interesting was the was the perceived rate of exertion and that classic, you know, um, uh, forty percent rule that that people like to bandy about, you know, and you're like, okay, max effort on this run, or you know, uh, max reps on uh, on your push-ups or whatever, and then they turn around and go, oh yeah, and that's only your forty percent, and you're like. I'm not sure if you did well at maths, but I, I don't know if that works out. But but the concept is is, is something that um, I'm definitely interested in and and do believe in. In that we have to probably believe that we've more to give, because in a, you know um, meeting our physical true limit is probably really it's it, it's almost arbitrary. We almost don't know how that is. Um, so our perception of what effort or what pain or what difficulty is. If we have a positive inclination, it's like how I feel about how I feel. If we have a positive inclination about that, then we're more likely to go deeper into that hurt locker in order to probably get that extra one or two percent. Um, so essentially, it's it, it it is the classic, and you know that's the that's a picture taken from the selection course back back in the day. But it's a a believing that you've always got more to give even when you're on your chin strap even and you know contextualize it to to COVID at the moment and and even I find you know like so I've I've transitioned out of the military in January had you know a, a, a tough year like everybody else have but you know you got to believe that you're more to give even when when there's there's difficulties difficulties um that you're going through next one um, self-efficacy is a really uh, powerful tool um, that I find. So um, 
South efficacy is uh, basically our judgment to sorry, our judgment on our ability to perform something based on our prior um, experience. So um, it's using past experience to indicate our, our, our future performance and realistically, right? Th and this is uh, this is how powerful it is. It's it's. Think of and like I've probably been lucky in so far as so the, the challenges that I faced previous, any of the military ones and even the passing of close friends, I was able to reflect on them during my um, period of real challenge and difficulty and use them then to pull through as well. You got through that so you can get through this. So, you know, the, the classic using um, and, and everybody's gone through like, you know, just because you haven't done you know, uh, um, or you haven't been in the military or whatever, whatever. Uh, the difficulty of the task is 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 completely uh, in context to you. But, um, you know, use anything. Maybe you stubbed your toe this morning and then, you know, you've got you've got a challenge that you're facing this afternoon. You're like, you know what? Got through that. So so I would say using and reflecting, really reflecting deeply on experiences, both positive and negatives and turning those negatives into, well, at least you got through it um, and, and kind of and kind of pushing through that. So I would say putting things into context and use experiences. And what I would again, the, the other little story that I would um, probably flip onto is in relation to that uh, that um, purple hoist that I was talking to you about. Um, so. They used to pivot me, so when I still obviously could not move, and they wanted to put me on a on a on a on a, on a high back chair, and um, they used to pivot me around um, onto the onto the onto the chair from there, and I was lucky enough that the guys in my in my SF unit had had sent me this very photo, and this is a photo of of uh, my selection course after or just after we had finished uh, the successful candidates on it, and in the back, everybody in the unit had. Had signed it, uh, and so um, people stuck it up on the wall alongside my bed. So every morning, where I was, you know, a, a quadriplegic in a pretty dire position, being spun around on that hoist, kind of, you know, FML kind of going through my brain, uh, I would look look at that picture and be able to see it and say, hey, you know, you got through that. That was pretty tough stuff. So if you can get through that. You can get through this as well. So um, I would, I would probably say to people, offer that up. Um, it, it works for me in terms of using past, past experience to to assist me in future performance. Um, and I think this is this is the last one. So this is um, basically a, a growth mindset, um, and it's you know having goal orientation and focusing on both near and far term goals. Um, you know your your task versus ego orientation, all your all your good Carol Dweck type stuff, but it's actually being understanding that a little bit, but basically not being not being fixed. It's like there's always a way, you know, whatever the challenge is, there's always something um, th that can be can be done or there's always a way, you know, just it's never the end. It's it's never there's, there's something else going on. It's it, it's just uh, because um, a fixed mindset will lead to obviously, you know, different challenges in itself and trying to trying to box around that. But I would I would probably use goal setting using um, probably in general tasks style motivation um, in order to probably get around things that seem uh, insurmountable. And uh, that picture. So um, when we talk about um, probably uh, like back in the military and deployability and all that kind of stuff post so um to give context on that one um uh probably the last last anecdote that i got um in late january they wheeled me upstairs in the in the in the um spinal injuries unit and they brought me in and my wife and my, my father were there and then i had a big circle of all of the staff that were part of you know the management team for me and it was a patient goal setting meeting so you know the physio the psych the occupational therapist the registrar and nurse the uh, consultant doctor the social worker the psych everybody was there right and they start talking about goal setting and you know classic things like i would um, I would like to get independent bladder control again i would like to have independent bowel control again so people stop going at me um, I would like to um, stand again. I would like to go to my friend's wedding in May, all this kind of stuff. But then I kind of said, look, that's all the that's all the 
Medium term, uh, I said, right, here's what I actually want. And I had a printout of the Australian um, Infantry Physical Employment Standard Assessment, um, which is a pretty, anybody who's, 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 who's been in the military and knows kind of uh, the PESA, uh, knows that particularly the infantry PESA is, is a tidy, tidy little test. The first part of it is um, a 15K um, stomp. I think it's with 40, 40 kilos in 155 minutes, right? That's phase one. And then you do, you know, leopard crawling and all that kind of good stuff. So I had the printout of that and I was like, listen, at the core of it, my job is I'm an infantry, I'm an infantry soldier. That's the physical employment test for that. Um, that's what I want. That's what I want to actually um, get at. That is, that is goal, you know, number 100 for me. And the doc, I could tell, you know, and I'm, I'm in a wheelchair, I've got a halo brace on, I've got a catheter, I've got bloody socks on me, you know, trying to keep the blood. And he's like, who is this lunatic? Um, and I got, I, you know, I understood that. I was like, look, if I don't aim for that, um, I, I, I won't get, I'll never get there. But if I do aim potentially for it, I'm, I might get closer to it, right? Um, so lo and behold, um, yeah, it took me, so that was, that picture was the all core peasant. And it took me two and a half years to actually finally um, bang out that that in infantry peza. But I think if you're following the kind of trail of this of this story, um, absolutely, um, I banged that out um, some two and a half years later, um, where nobody knew, nobody was any the wiser, just myself and a, um, the the PT guy in the gym uh, standing there in his in his in his uh, tight tight red shorts. Um, would with, with a stopwatch so but but the feeling of self-worth was was amazing so I would strongly advocate to to goal setting and have a, a growth mindset Um, I think if we click, yeah so look uh, that's that's pretty much that's pretty much uh, it in terms of the the talk itself the the four things that I would offer up in terms of um, maybe learnings or something like that um, as as listed there, I've got like a bit of different uh, media bits and pieces like podcasts and and and, and um, a, a book and a few other things out. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I, I've got, you know, if anyone's interested in chatting to me and, um, you know, got the uh, LinkedIn or Twitter or, or just ping me or hit up Kyron or anything like that. But uh, but yeah, that's 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 pretty much it. Um, there you go. Um happy to happy to answer any really really hard questions on all of that good stuff really thanks a million for that i have a couple of questions for you here so i'll start with i suppose i'll start with my 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 own big question first that i have to ask and um, and that's to do with um agency so down here in victoria we've we've you know we've lost i, I suppose the, a lot of the lessons that we we learn in the military we can we can bring and there's a corollary for those lessons that we can pass into um, into our into ordinary day-to-day -day life, and we often talk about that. And we we hear all these people like Nathaniel Fick, and we hear Jocko Willink, and all these kind of guys talk about all these books and these schools of like I learned this in the Navy SEALs, and I learned that in that unit, and I learned this in the other unit, and you know, and they're all really well and good. But the fact of the matter is that. Um, where we are now in 2020, a lot of people have lost their agency and, and by agency, I mean their ability to make their own decisions or have an influence on their own actions. Um, and that's because the environment that's around us. So um, how it's very fair to say that you probably you, you did in massive way in, in, in the sort of literal and the figurative sense, you lost your agency over yourself and over your physical being etc so how did you get around that um, as as an individual and um, during the time of your rehabilitation yeah that's that's like um a really good question and and, it, and it's really challenging because like it, it to me uh, it was like you know that feeling of loss of control the feeling of lack of self-worth and all that kind of stuff it's it's a really difficult way then not to go down that that path i think some of it is like acknowledging that right so i found that like acknowledging that there was a dark road that you could go down and um, but but kind of like recognizing talking to people 
um, and then being able to navigate saying, I know that's there, but I'm going to try and try and stick to the positives because we kind of know that like the positives are, for instance, uh, uh, within that particular case, even with, with all else being so difficult, we can kind of like control the controllables, do what we can do and know what's good for us stuff. So even like the kind of setting of routines and, and patterns and, and know what's good, like, you know, coming off um, our, our, our mobile devices or doing some reading instead, all that kind of good stuff, just controlling our, our mannerisms and stuff like that in order to feel a level of um, self-control and kind of garner a bit of a bit of self-worth. And also I'd be a strong advocate of of just talking to other people about it because what I found was you'd be surprised how many other people also also feel kind of similar um, when, when they're in situations like that. We got more? Yeah, we actually, they're actually flying in and people are people are actually texting me at the moment. Um, and yeah, so I know uh, Rich Adams over in New Zealand has asked um, the question about um, where is the line between pushing your limit and taking the guidance of like of, of the experts? I, and I understand that, you know, as as kind of people, maybe not so much necessarily as military people, but as kind of young men, we have this idea we're, we're you know we're full of enthusiasm and energy and verve and all these kind of things um, and uh, I suppose uh, I suppose Rich's question what he's getting to is that what it, what he's trying to say is that when you get all the advice from those you know the experts and all of the, the therapists and everything that you have to meet where do you have to say you know I have to strike the balance between I got to do this but I got to feel better about myself um, and I got to, I got to, I got to push the envelope. And, and you're a guy who's kind of like used to pushing the envelope. You, know, you, you used to kind of like going into the extreme, pushing the extreme and all that. And having known you for the 21 months of the cadetship uh, and, and our couple of years, the two of us were stationed <laughs> in various parts of the country. So I, I, I know the type of guy, but I know, I know Rich is particularly eager to know the answers to this question. Yeah, again, like that's that's a really good one because um, like I don't I don't think I have an answer to that either. Um, like I think that there is a real it's almost like an individual balance. Like I, I've been asked that before as well. It's like, you know, when when is it pushing towards the limit and when is it, you know, being being stupid about it? Um, and I think some cases I was really close to that, even in terms of my own recovery. So, you know, walking or like the piece of video where I'm walking around without without an aid, um, you know, it's, it, it's a little like you know you could say isn't that a bit reckless, Billy? And um, yeah, yeah, I, I would say it's twofold. I would always take the advice um, like um, of any kind of professional, obviously particularly um, medical professional professionals in that particular instance. Um, but while they would understand the, um, I suppose the context of the um, injury or whatever it is, um, what we would try and do is also try and apply the context of the individual and, and working off that balance. But I'd be, I'd be very hesitant to ever say going against it. Um, but I think there's a balance between kind of what, what you kind of want to do or what you can kind of push to yourself, but still staying within the balance of what's recommended and, and all the rest of it. But it's really down to the individual and, because there's two flip sides to it, it, it's really tricky. Cool. Okay, so we've got a couple of we've got a couple of great ones that are coming in on the chat here at the moment. So Gary, who is a, an old mate of mine down here in Melbourne, he asks, um, "What do you use as a visualization technique as well as part of his recovery?" Gary, by the way, is a big Sydney Swans fan, so um, you're in good company there. Yeah, good good stuff. Um, so. Um, I actually, um, and again, it, it was it, like, you know, um, I didn't know anything about it before. And I, I, you know, I'd probably done some imagery and visualization stuff, particularly in terms of um, uh, shoot, uh, you know, uh, shooting or uh, combat related tendencies and all that kind of stuff. But actually the psych in the hospital helped me out, particularly with some, uh, and I'd be a strong advocate of mindfulness um, and also then visualization and um, a tool that uh, she particularly used in terms of pain management was like even uh, visualizing um, 
non-moving uh, blue things. She used like, you know, the color blue, quite relaxing, just visualizing like a blue sky, closing your eyes and doing that kind of stuff as as pain management technique. And I did find um, because I did try and get myself off, you know, any of those uh, pain management kind of um, um, medications. Um, so definitely visualization from a pain management technique. I definitely use that. And also, I suppose um, I um, not so much uh, visualization, but definitely um, imagery, keying words and self-talk. So, for instance, um, you know, using words like when I was trying to uh, create some biomechanic low to mo locomotion, like back to actually running gross motor function, uh, kind of saying words in my head like flow or relax because you know um, there was a lot of spasticity still in my limbs um, so using things like that visualization flow relax smooth using those kind of things to to actually uh, for the biomechanics really worked well that's, for me that's interesting that you talk about that because uh, I, I'm one of these these fucking sports nerds forgive my language I'm one of these sports nerds as well and I know that uh, Rory McIlroy's thing the world number one golfer his famous thing is that when he lines up for a shot, he says two words. He says process and spot. And as he lines up, he says process and spot. And so, um, so I'm one of those firm believers. So, so you've kind of landed upon something that's that's a really interesting thing. Uh, I remember um, going through a couple of a couple of tests myself. You and myself have been some of the, some some of what they would term the school, same schools in the Irish Defence Forces and. Um, uh, I, you know, we, we've been to some of the same hangouts, you know, we've done the same exercises, the CAC, all that kind of thing. So uh, the infamous disco room, as we call it, or the disco and dibble. Uh, dibble is a town in Lebanon, as everyone knows. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's the kind of like the, the famous, uh, the famous one there. And people wonder, like, what, like, what do you talk about when you go through there? So it's about that self-talk. Yep. Um, I suppose the next uh, question I have here is, we have a bit of a mantra in um, in, in Disaster Relief Australia, uh, formerly Team Rubicon Australia, and we ask about uh, what advice would you give to a DRA volunteer when engaging with a disaster victim who has just lost their home? Um, and they also give a bit of an addendum on that and that they say, uh, mental purposes, one of uh, the maximums, we help people on their worst day. And I suppose just for context, an example would be that in South Australia um, during quarter one of this year, you know, we were, so, you, you know, you and I, Billy, are from, we're from Ireland, you know, the weather isn't too crazy, we don't get bushfires, we don't get too crazy things, um, but what we do get is, you know, we get a bit of flooding in the Midlands, and we get a bit of, you know, we get a bit of gorse fires up in the mountains, generally on military ranges, nothing too crazy, but um, I remember seeing a pile uh, in a person's house in Adelaide, that was literally their entire house and two cars in a pile of literally garbage in somebody's house. And it was one, and it was to look at somebody and say, well, that's your belonging, there are your belongings. The only yep. thing standing was their multi-fire or multi-fuel uh, burning stove. Um, and that's because it could survive the heat of the fire. Um, so I suppose those people, when all is lost, what is the thing? What, what's the thing you say? What yeah. advice would you give? Yeah, sorry, I was only I was only smiling because someone's dropped into the chat that it was only a matter of time before you dropped the f bomb. So that was that was pretty funny. But uh, sorry, uh, in relation to the question, look, I'm I, like you know, it's it's um, thankfully for me, it, it's not something that that that's ever happened. But you you know, it, it's probably hard to fathom the difficulty of what what people are going through. And I, I wouldn't be. I wouldn't surmise to be a, a, a psychologist and being able to to relate or being able to um, to to actually. And, uh, but uh, like from my own perspective, what, what would we try and do, um, or what would I? Uh, I guess I suppose you try and. Um, uh, or if I was to put it in context, what would I have liked, for instance, when I was at uh, my particular worst day? What what would I have um, liked for for supporters or, or or people to do? And I think a lot of it. And again, it depends on the person. It depends on the context. Some people are angry. Some people are disappointed. Some people are 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 okay because they're still in the shock stage. Or some people are already moving towards the what next kind of stuff. And um, but I think a lot of it is kind of um, letting 
letting those kind of people lead the conversations like like um and i found for me support the the, the support people who um probably worked best for me were those who it wasn't like they're going to jump in um with kind of the solutions for me um, it was more an enablement uh, thing uh, as opposed to solution. So, you know, like like the story, I don't want you to to, to peel open the yogurt for me. Um, I want you just to be understanding and enable me to probably to to probably do it myself. So, um, that's probably the only thing I I would I, I would I would offer in terms of that. But um, yeah, I suppose it's all in context, and and it's just a really difficult situation for people to get through. The, the, the gentleman who said uh, it's only a matter of time is Pac-Man. Don't pay any attention to him. He's actually from, he was actually born and bred in Dublin. So, <laughs> so yeah. he, cla he claims to be a fireman up in Sydney, but you never know. <laughs> so he's actually from Dublin, so don't listen to him. Um, I suppose we've got, we've probably got one or two more questions uh, before we wrap up and let, uh, let you back to your home life. Uh, yeah. We have Shari, who I'm sure you'll bump into next week. Uh, Shari wants to know, uh, is there any lasting effects? How do you feel? And I suppose um, you and I had lunch once or uh, we, we had lunch once up in Sydney and, and I saw that your hands are a bit, your hands are a bit difficult uh, from time yeah. to time. Or is there an emotional uh, part of that or is there a, a, a physical, a mental part of that? How do you feel at the moment? I th so uh, physical restrictions, I would say some limited um, dexterity and sensation in the palm or side of my hands, but not nothing that would you know stop me from doing act all activities of, of everyday living. Um, and other than that, really, um, obviously gross motor function. So things like um, overall biomechanics. Um, so like, you know, the smoothness of running is like when you when you would see me jogging, you would see it's it's a little bit off. Um, uh, so, but in general, to be honest with you, most, the va you know, I get spasms in the morning, but in general, the vast majority of things, thankfully, um, have come back to a, really a standard of, you know, um, uh, you wouldn't probably day to day unless you kind of knew the backstory would have, would have any, um, would have, would have anything in that. In terms of the, the mental side of it, as you mentioned, Kyron, actually, um, obviously, um, having gone through it all and stuff, I would see it and probably applying my own. Kind of what I mentioned in terms of self-efficacy, I would now use this probably as ammunition for myself going through any any challenges into into the future and stuff like that. So even like, you know, transitioning at the start of the year and I was like, you know, basically almost missing my tribe and stuff like that. It was like, well, you know, you've got through tougher things than this. So so surely you can get through this one. So, yeah. Well, you said the key word, the tribe, and that's interesting you said that. So uh, Team Rubicon Australia slash Disaster Relief Australia, we always just define ourselves as a tribe. So I think you'll fit right in. <laughs> so uh, I'll post you up the T-shirt next week, my friend. So we, uh, we have two questions. Well, I suppose we have two questions left. Um, what is the main inspiration that, um, that keeps you going? Is it family or is this... So achievement or, you know, looking at the kids or, you know, that kind of thing. Where, where do you where do you feel? What's the main thing that keeps you up and soldiering on, as we say? Oh, um, yeah, I do. Uh, I probably do think um, obviously fam family is a big thing. Like, um, you know, um, exceptionally, it's like exceptionally lucky in an awful lot of like, uh, and we didn't talk about it really much, but like the other part of it is, like an exceptional amount of luck as well and the way I would look at it is um you know I got the rub of the green on a couple of occasions so that just means I gotta I gotta take it for what it is so we were really lucky that for instance we were because at the time you know with no function whatsoever so um we were lucky enough that we were able to to have kids so and I think that probably even um then um, changed my outlook in relation to even the military and stuff like that and saying right family is a real big um, driver behind behind what what we do now and all the rest of it so I would say I think what drives me now and what I'm inspired by is trying to be trying to be a good parent um trying to be you know uh, a, but and um, you know like everybody else try to get by try to be successful try and do all that kind of stuff and yeah that's, that's probably it Uh, by the way, you guys, rub of the green is something that, like, if you stand next to me or Billy, you kind of you kind of get that. It's kind of what happens. 
It's gonna, <laughs> you're gonna get it. It's kind of like just like standing beside us. It's something that happens. It's kind of like it's sort of axiomatic. So I suppose um, that's really it. I suppose I have one question left, and I know that he's been pestering me all night. It's uh, poor old Rich Adams in New Zealand as well. He's got the he's got the burning question. It's literally driving him absolutely crazy. I was going to curse again as well. He's going to ask. Uh, the score on the football, or the score on the rugby at the weekend, Ireland France. What do we reckon? Uh, well, um, I'm I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go with an Ireland win, but they're not gonna win by enough to win the uh, win the uh, win the uh, the championship because they need to win by a ridiculous amount. But yeah, I'll go for Ireland. Why not? So just before we just before we we, we let everybody go, I just like to remind people that the greatest. Um, uh, the greatest unbeaten streak of New Zealand was 18 straight games, uh, and Ireland beat that in Soldier Field in Chicago in 2018. Billy, am I right? Am I right? Yeah, I think so. I think yeah. so. I, I, I don't know if uh, if bragging to a to a Kiwi about rugby is a is a good idea, though. You know. I know, but but <laughs> but poor old, poor old Rich has just a level of arrogance when it comes to rugby that it's just like needs. We need to put him down at every level, <laughs> every, chance, every chance we get. So, uh, so beating uh, beating uh, New Zealand is, is is a significant milestone for for Ireland. But you know, there you go. I mean, there's there's an ongoing debate. There's a couple of probably South African lads on this chat as well, and um, that would probably start claiming Faster Clerk is the greatest nine of all of all times when everybody knows it's clearly Connor Murray. Well, good monster man, good monster man, yeah. And this coming from a Leinster, this coming from a South Dull as well, a Leinster chap. So that's it. I think we've I think we've uh, finished all our questions. And before we take up too much of everybody's evening, because um, I know it's late up there in Queensland, um, we'll wrap up the conversation. So everybody would agree that Billy has a varied and exciting life at this stage. Um, his story is one of a typical boyhood dream, full of uh, daring adventures and dizzying excitement. And most significantly, his tales are those of um, reflection, perseverance, determination, grit, and most importantly, love. Uh, Billy has uh, immortalized his story in a book, which I'm going to share the screen with you now. Um, which is on the left-hand side of the, the page there, um, Unbowed. Um, this book is available on Amazon, either in paperback or in Kindle. Um, so please feel free to uh, have a look on there. Um, Billy, unfortunately, we can't meet in person, which is a, a very sad thing at the moment because we're all locked down. and I'm locked down in Victoria, but uh, a lot of us are... are uh, in various stages of lockdown around the country. But I know you're meeting the Briz Vegas crew next week. So uh, make sure you wear your uh, your T-Baz for that one uh, because they'll probably take the skin off you. Um, so all I'd like to say is thank you very much for your time. There is a small uh, token of our appreciation in your inbox for the moment. If anybody w wants to catch up with Billy or has any further questions they'd like to ask him, he's very active on social media, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, etc. And you can catch a number of podcasts online, either on Spotify or on Apple Podcasts that are worth a listen. Um, there's a one that's particularly worth a listen. It's from Ireland, so it might be a little bit tricky to load up. It's uh, The Irishman Abroad with Charles Regan, um, where Billy tells the whole story. Um, so that's really it for me, guys. And I'm sure from Billy, thank you very much for your time. Billy, I'll give you the last word. No, cheers. Just Thanks a million, and it's an awesome organization. So, um, yeah, best luck to everybody in the future. And if anybody wants to hit me up or have a chat, yeah, just do so. Thanks, thanks for having me. All right. Okay, guys, thanks for everybody. Uh, you know where to find me on the mobile phone or if you want Billy's contact details, and uh, hopefully we'll all chat again soon. All right, bye. Out.